Hello and welcome back to A Drunk History of Middle Earth. This is a show where we take the Legendarium created by J.R. Tolkien and have a good, simple, wholesome chat about it. Sometimes it's a drunk person, me, trying to explain stories or events, and sometimes it's breaking down the stories and concepts as if we're talking to a drunk person. I'm Chris, I'm an avid talking nerd, I'm still learning and realising how much I actually don't know. And joining me is your co-host and my lovely wife Rebecca. Do you want to say hello? Hello, I'm Rebecca, uh, a complete novice to all things Tolkien and um, nerdy in general. Although now I've watched all three films, extended editions, and can now confirm that I have been converted to the religion headed by L. Ron Tubbard. Long may he live. <laughs> right. <laughs> Zoltan. Zoltan. <laughs> that's the intro sorted. Let's get into today's episode. Okay, finally, we're recording. Happy Thursday, Becca. We're recording this on Thursday instead of a Friday or a Saturday. How are you? I'm good, yes. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, thank you. Had a fantastic weekend. Um, It was my 30th on the the 26th and Becca arranged a surprise birthday party for me on the... Last Saturday, the first, first of April. First yeah. of April, yeah. April Fools. Yeah, uh, all my friends were there. Uh, well, most of my friends were there, and then we went to London the next day, where we went to Harry Potter Studios, saw Les Mis on West End, uh, did a VR experience. Overall, amazing. So I am chipper AF. Um, yeah, and you're at a Hindu on Saturday, and I'm busy tomorrow, so we're recording this uh, a couple of days early. Are you excited? We're doing it over lunch, so it's an afternoon one. Yeah, I can't wait for the CCC <laughs> yeah. afterwards. I ran in there, I finished I finished the meeting, it was lunchtime, and I ran into Becca, um, and I was like, I've had an idea for lunch, we can have CCC, it's chilli, chips and cheese. Um, so yeah, that's, that's our lunch. Anyway, Lord of the Rings, what did we talk about last week? Can you remember? Um... Yes. <laughs> Can you? It was right. It was what it was. Uh, it was what people got up to in the years of bliss. What the Valar were up to. So they were um, chilling. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, it was. It was like what they were all chilling about. So Aule was making stuff. Elmo was in the sea, <laughs> keeping himself to himself. Uh, Elmo, yes. Um, we covered what Yavanna. Um, you know, she was going to Middle Earth. Help trying to help things. That's Orman. the only way I can remember any names. So Elron Hubbard Elrond, and Elmo. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. But you also called Eru Elmo, so you're gonna have to think about that one. Uh, yeah. So we just covered what people were up to in the years of bliss. You can go back and listen to that last episode, um, which I had, I had a lot of fun doing. We got a bit pretty deep talking about free will in that episode. Um, we also talked about the cosmology. Uh, what sorry? Where elves and men fit in the cosmology? Yeah. Um, do you remember what two gifts men were given by Eru Iluvatar? Frankincense and myrrh. Fuck off! No. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, free will and the chance to. Uh, well, when they die, they go to the great halls. Yeah, the timeless halls. We know they leave the the circles of the world, right? I can't help but say the great hall. I feel like it's always a great hall. You better not be thinking about fucking Harry Potter. So <laughs> swear down. We can't keep bringing up Harry Potter on this podcast. Right? I'm not. We're not even that big of fans. I'm not. It's just majority of places are called the Great Hall. Like when, like medieval banqueting, it was in the Great Hall. It just feels more organic to say the Great Hall instead of the Timeless Halls. Well, you're doing a disservice to yourself because the Great Hall of Edoras was called Meadowseld. Oh so no! So get your shit together. Anyway, um, apologies, dear listener. I lied to you last week. I said, and I've lied to you, Rebecca. I said we were going to talk about the dwarves, ants, and eagles. Yeah. As usual, started making my notes and realised that there's actually enough material for one episode just on the creation of dwarves, who are hands down. I'm showing my bias here. Absolute favourite fantasy race ever. So we'll cover ants and eagles next week, perhaps. Um, but today is all about this just creation of the dwarves, and I could talk forever about dwarves, so don't expect this to be just the only episode we do about them. It's just too much history. I've said it before, I'd love to have seen the Silmarillion, but about dwarves instead of elves. But, you know, hey-ho. Um, but yeah, so so dwarves, what are your uh, perceptions of dwarves? Like, what are your thoughts about them? Uh, how, do you, how do you view dwarves in fantasy? 
greedy, like stocky men who are short, who have beards and like to drink and eat and mine sparkly things. So pretty much you. Well, until you said mine and sparkly things, you are eye fucking me something fierce, but not in a nice <laughs> way. I was just like, and when you said greedy, I was like, I'm not, I'm not greedy. <laughs> Are Am you I? joking? Am I? I'm... You sat here eating Swiss roll before you CCC. I've offered you some. I said you're a good co host, so I've got you some snacks. Yeah, and just because I didn't want the snacks doesn't mean you have to eat them all. It's leftover party food, it's got to go somewhere. <laughs> Fucking hell. Anyway, fair dues, fair, uh, fair representation of dwarves. Now, I thought that Tolkien was kind of like the origin of dwarves as we see them, but I. Don't think that was quite right because I think Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was out before, like Tolkien was like at... this story. Yeah, yeah, and the way well the way they were portrayed on the fil- in the film. Yeah. Because Lord of the Rings was published in nineteen fifty four, so I think Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs might have been before that. But anywho, so where where did they come from in in Middle Earth is what we're going to look at today. I think I know. Well, we have discussed it before. So where do you know? What do you know of their origins? From the Earth. Yeah. From the mountain. Yeah, okay. And and who made them? Do you remember? A guy whose wife was really annoyed because <laughs> they were like tearing shit up in the forest. Well, no, she was worried they were going to tear shit up in the forest. Okay. Because and they were she was... so greedy and like wanting to craft things that they would need to use. Wood. Yeah, I, I, again, I don't think it was so much like a concern about the greed or, or stuff like that. It was just more like... Yours want to build, and to build, they're going to need wood. Yeah. And and for the wood, they're going to tear up my trees that I love so much. Um, but yeah, so they, they came from our favourite Valar husband, Aulia. And whence did, or where, when did they come from? Uh, it was the best I could find. Now, so the years, of, the early years are very hazy. And the, again, uh, we should do an episode on the counting of the years, because it's a whole chapter, I think, in... The Nature of Middle Earth, which is a book I've just got the notification today is, is being delivered soon. Um, and it's, it's about the count of the years. But the best I could place them was they were made during the time between the lamps falling and the trees flowering, which is, that was about 35,000 years, I think, uh, if I remember our last episode right. But this time, I, did, I only learned today, this time in between the lamps falling and the trees starting to glow was called the sleep of Yavanna because Yavanna, Aule's wife, uh, put a lot of nature in the world to sleep so that it wouldn't grow in order to protect it. Okay. Because at this time, so coming from the north, Melkor's in the north mining out, out the halls under Autum- Autumno, um, a lot, there were a lot of beasts and monsters roaming about and they would just destroy whatever they could. Yeah. Um, so Yavanna, when she was coming to Middle Earth to heal and, and protect and that, she was also putting things to sleep. Okay. So you can imagine like a cute little bunny rabbit. She was like, just, you need to sleep now. So um, in hibernation until yeah, it's safe. Yeah, exactly. Until, it, until it's safe, until I can come and wake you up. Which is cool. Um, but there was this was a long time. And Aule was so excited and looking forward to the children of Iluvatar coming that he couldn't wait anymore. Um, and I can't blame him. I, I am like that. I get really excited thinking about all the good things to come, and you just want to do whatever you can to kind of like speed it up or start. You know where I'm like when I get an idea. In my, yeah, when I get an idea in my head, yeah, and I want to do you something, can't be stopped. I, I feel like it's going to be cool or like it be benefit people. I'm just fucking like shit off a stick. Yeah, I'm off like a, a shot. The difference though is that you remember that Melkor and Aule are very similar. Yes. In the sense that they both want to create things, right? Yeah. But, quick quiz, why are they different in... So they both want to create, but how does Melkor differ from Aule in that? Melkor wants to create, but still have power over them. And Aule wants to create, but for them to sort of just live their lives and eat, eat it's like almost like happy for them. And wants them to succeed. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what I've got here. And that Aule is different because he wants to teach them and he wants to, he wants things to teach and share, to teach and love and share things with. Yeah. Which that is the best reason, I think, to, to, to want to create anything. And so, 
in Middle Earth in secret because he was worried that the other Valar would blame his creations for like evil and stuff if they found out. Far beneath an unknown mountain, Aule made in secret the seven dwarf fathers. And uh, there's some really cool art I saw this morning where you've got this like big bearded Aule guy and it's um it's right under a mountain in like a pool. And he's holding, he's like crafting the dwarfs in his hands, and you can see like the other seven laid about, like they're all like naked, just with the long beards and that. Um, and it's really cool, like the way you can see that he's actually like shaping them. Mm. Um, but if you remember, the Aino in the music didn't dare contribute to the children. Yeah. So as a result, Aule had no clue. He had no idea what the children of Iluvatar would look like. To be, to be fair, giving them two legs, he was very fucking close. <laughs> so, um, But he had no idea what they properly looked like. And it was a dangerous time. The shadow of Melkor was over Middle-earth. So he wished the dwarves to be strong and unyielding. And he made them strong and unyielding. He made them that way. And dwarves, as they are in Lord of the Rings, look exactly like they did when they were first made. There's been no change whatsoever. As Aule created them, so they were they pretty are. perfect. They've not had to evolve. Well, we'll, we'll too get much. we'll get onto that, yeah. But um, so because Melkor was running around, Aule made the dwarves strong to endure the world, and they are described as being stone hard, stubborn, fast in friendship, and fast in enmity. And they suffer toil, hunger, and hurt of body more readily than all the other speaking races. And they live far longer than men, but not forever. And as a ballpark figure, do you want to guess how long dwarves generally live? 300 years. Super duper close. Yes, a lot of them have lived. It's generally around 250. So 250 to 300, right? And I learned something this morning, which I need to go back and research properly because I didn't pursue the source as much as I should have. Um, But that before they're 30, dwarves aren't considered able to like they're not considered suitable for like hard work or heavy lifting and stuff like they're still considered like kids and a bit weak which is why i think i can't remember who i I don't know if it was thorin or his son uh, his dad thrain or or his granddad but they slew an orc called azog the defiler when they were 32 and that was seen as like a massive feat like imagine it'd be like imagine if we 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 get a bar like you know we go in the garage and see that our Kids lifted like hundred kilos deadlifts off the floor, and yeah. she's like one and a half. It was like it's kind of like whoa, fuck me, you shouldn't be able to do that. But then, right, this is weird. Apparently, between the ages of thirty and forty, dwarves are described as hardening into the forms and the strength that they will have. And then, generally, between the age of about forty and two hundred and fifty, dwarves are at their fucking peak. That's their peak. They're at their peak for two hundred and ten years. Um, and it's not until the last 10 years of their life that dwarves start to age. And when they do, they age rapidly. Um, and for any of the weebs listening to this, in Dragon Ball, Goku and Vegeta, they're Saiyans. And Saiyans are described as pretty much the same way. They live a lot longer than normal humans, but they don't start to age till right to the end of their life. They're basically in their peak until they die, right? And it's only in the last couple of years of their life they start to age rapidly. So I wonder if that like, sounds really good. Yeah, I know, right? So I wondered if uh, like Toriyama, the creator of Dragon Ball, had ever like read Lord of the Rings or, or well, the Silmarillion or something. That's it. It's just the pretty uh, pretty interesting in terms of lifespan. But they don't live forever. And when they die, they do die. We'll we'll go on to what happens to them then, because unfortunately there's um, something quite upsetting. I'm going to need to come to, but we'll we'll get to that bit. Um, and so in the very hour that they were created, Aule started to teach them how to speak. He couldn't wait. He was waking, like, imagine like just waking up straight away. He's like, right, fucking lesson time. And he devised this whole language for them called Kuzdul, which is the Dwarven language. And he started to teach it to them. Um, and at that point, Eru spoke to Aule and Aule fell silent. And I can only imagine shit himself like can you imagine like when you were little um if your parents come back while you were in the middle of doing something naughty or something you know you shouldn't be doing like if they said stay out of that cupboard 
And then it's usually like the silence is worse than being shouted at immediately. So like <laughs> kind of, yeah. The moment that I did drop dead Fred move and went. Oh, you got you got you got dog poo all over your grandma's carpet, didn't you? When you were little on the couch. On the couch, I, I yeah. recreated the scene. You can recreate yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. So that scene for anyone listening, um, the scene in Drop Dead Fred, you know, where he's like, dog poo, dog poo, smelly, smelly dog poo. Dog so, poo on the stairs. Yeah, and her imaginary friend is like wiping dog shite everywhere. <laughs> um, how old were you when you did it? But Becca recreated this scene because she thought it was funny I think when that she was, was a kid. eight or nine. Yeah, eight or nine, thought she'd recreate Drop Dead Fred and wipe dog shit everywhere. It was in your grandma's. Yeah. Yeah, oof. Anyway, I imagine uh, you felt how Aule felt when Eru started speaking <laughs> with him. And... I did debate doing just kind of like the direct quotes um, because it's but it's a lot of thou and hat thy and I don't doubt your ability to understand it but I'll just put it in simple terms that it's just easily digestible for anybody who's listening to this while you're driving or what have you. That was really kind of you because well, it, actually I probably wouldn't have understood. Well, that this, well. Uh, the the gist of what he said is Eru said to Aule, "Why have you done this? I gave you the power over yourself." And that's it. It's beyond your authority to make life, as you fucking well know. <laughs> you know it's beyond your power and authority to properly make life. Again, because they didn't contribute to the music that would make the children of Iluvatar, right? Yeah. Eru then went on and said, look at them. They only think and only move and only speak when you make them and when you're thinking about them. They're t- So they're, they're tied to Aule's will completely. And he said, when your attention goes away from them, they just, they just stand still. Is that what you really wanted? Um, and Aule, he got the telling off from his dad, right? And then, uh, so Aule had essentially made automatons that were bound to his will. So he could make them move, he could make them speak, he could make them do things. But if, as soon as his attention drops, they, they stop. Because there's nothing keeping them going, right? Yeah. And Aule... This is where he differs from Melkor. Aule straight away realised he'd fucked up, right? And immediately he was sorry and he was sheepish. Like, I've mentioned it before. Do you know when um, our daughter bit the dog the other week? Yeah. And I told her off. And she immediately she understood she'd done something really wrong. And she went quiet. And then when she started crying, she was doing that proper little kid sob of like... Yeah. <laughs> like that. Yeah. Aule was like one step away from that. But unlike Melkor, if, if everyone said this to Melkor, Melkor would have just exploded. Well, oh, fuck you, Dad. You're not the boss of me. And then just created more. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to do it even harder. Um, but, you know, Aule has humility and he loves his dad. And, and it's for pure reasons he did it. And he says back to Eru... No, I didn't want that. I just wanted other things to love and teach and show the beauty of the universe that you envisioned. And he said, it seems to me in Arda that there's room for many things to live and love it. But for now, it's empty. And, you know, that this is his case. And he says, like, it's empty. And he says, I've been impatient and I want to make uh, and I want to make things. It's what I want to do. It's in my nature. I always want to make things. And he said, like, it's in my nature because of you, like, in the, in the nicest way. And then this bit that Aule said, it really touched me, like, reading this as a, as a dad. Um, because, and I'm going to give you the exact quote here, and I'll, I'll see how you feel about it. Aule then says to Eru, The child of little understanding that makes a play of the deeds of his father may do so without thought of mockery. He does it because he is the son of the father. But what shall I do now so that thou be not angry with me forever? And I read that and I was just like, and it's because it's because like our kid was running around at the time. Like I was just making a quick note, and she was like, she was playing and she was bringing me books for her to read, and she was doing stuff. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> bless you. And it's like it's it, you know it's true. So he's like, I did it because like but he basically he, so he, he's got humility, but he's basically saying to Eru, I learned it from watching you. <laughs> like he's just that's the the roundabout way of him saying that. How could Eru be angry with that, right? Yeah. How could how could if if our kid said that to me, if I if do you know if I'd uh, if I walked in and she'd like pulled my computer apart for example, I, yeah, I, my my first response might be like oh for fuck's sake, but like if then she I would be like that's your fault you left the door no, open. but then if she no, but like if, if she said to me she was like I saw that you made the computer and I saw like what you were doing with it and I just wanted to do the same thing like I, you can't in in all con- in good consciousness be angry with that right. 
Yeah. You, you, you might be frustrated and you might be like, oh, for God's sake. But like, you can't fault the, the motivation. Yeah. It's just, all right, you want to be like your dad, right? And, she's, and I wouldn't think she was doing it to piss me off. It, it, she's doing it without thought of mockery. It's the same thing. It's like, you're doing it because your dad does it. And I'd, you know, I'd be touched, right? Um, but Aule wanted things to be okay with Eru. And so he raised a great hammer and he cried as he did it. And he was going to destroy the dwarves because he, he thought he'd upset Eru. But in the very moment that he raised the hammer, the dwarves shrank away and they begged for mercy and they were afraid. And that was because Eru had taken compassion on Aule's... Uh, sorry, Eru had taken basically pity on Aule's compassion and his desire. And he then said to Aule that he accepted Aule's offer even as it was made, that making the dwarves as an act of love and, and creation was as an offering to Eru, and, and, and Eru accepted that, right? And he said to Aule, like, can you see now that I've given them life? Yeah. That they have lives of their own, else they wouldn't have reacted like that. Um, so Aule threw down his great hammer and was pleased, and he said... He gave thanks to Eru and said, May Eru bless my work and amend it. And Eru stopped him here and he said, No chance, pal. I'm not going to amend your way, work in any way. Um, I, I've given them life and that's all I'm going to do. Um, however, I won't have them mess up my design. Because again, Eru is very big on the design, the, the plan, the, the, the music. Uh, and he said, Your impatience won't be rewarded. So... They need to sleep until the firstborn elves awake. And it'll seem like a long time to you and a long time to them, but you'll just have to fucking wait. <laughs> uh, and he also said that he saw there would be a lot of strife between elves and dwarves, the, children, the elves being the children of his creation, and the dwarves, the children of his adoption. But you just have to deal with it. Everyone will just have to fucking deal with it. Um, and so therefore, Aule set the seven fathers in far sundered places. He took them all over the Middle Earth and laid them arrest. And then he went back to Valinor to wait while the, the long years went on. And I just think that story is absolutely touching. Um, of just, you know, the, 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 just, yeah, like, as a, like, I read this, like, it, it's so weird how, I wondered how much of being a parent filtered into Tolkien because, and this sounds incredibly cheesy to say, but like, Reading this now, because I read it all a couple of years ago, but like we've got it, like I said, we've got an eighteen-month-old daughter, right? Reading this now as a dad, it, it hits weird. That like different things hit harder. Yeah. And it's so sort of like um, Denethor and Faramir. I always thought Denethor was a cunt, right? But then I'm like, now I'm I'm incensed, like even more. I'm like, you can't fucking treat your kid like that, you shit. And I, I don't know. It's just um, we well, yeah, as a creation stories go. How do you uh, what do you think of that one? Um. Yeah, I like it. I think um, I just I'm so curious as to how he's made them quite close to what humans look like. Yeah, I thought this because and I, I don't how know would what, you know where to start? Well, the thing is, right? I don't know. Well, he, he made them as he's made them hardy. He made them strong, right? And that's what he did. So, like, thick set, tough. Like, you can understand that. But also, it goes back to in the big, be- like in the beginning, in the beginning, in the beginning. In the beginning uh, no, but Aule uh, and the other Valar, they took on forms that were close to the children of Iluvatar anyway. So how could they do that without knowing what the children of Iluvatar were going to look like? Unless Eru looks like that, and you know, like you know, like God is, you know, like, there's that quote like. No matter made who, in God's image. Yeah, well, made, made in God's made, made in God's image. But there's also another one where it's like that it's to do with colonialism and conquering other nations, but it's like, um, if you worship a god, subconsciously in your head, your god looks like you. So, if unless Eru's got a true, like, a, a form that he takes on that's, like, humanoid, that might explain it. Um, but, yeah, it's just, uh, it's interesting. Um, are, you ready, are you ready for your first eye roll of the episode? Go on, Because there's another name that you need to remember. So... The dwarves don't call Aule Aule. They uh, they use his Kuzdul name, which is Mahal, which means maker. Um, so the dwarves will always call 
Auli Mahal. Nice. And that'll be on the that'll be on the test later. <laughs> now, to the bit that upset me earlier. I in in previous episodes, uh, dear listener, I incorrectly asserted, and I think it was one of the ones when we were watching the film. So I was abs- I'll have been absolutely wankered when I said it, right? Um, in previous episodes, I've said that when dwarves die, they return to the stone. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. Well, turns out that might have just been fucking elvish propaganda. <laughs> so that's only what those Dorognul would have you think. And I specifically looked up what I looked up an insult for elves. Dorognul in Kuzdul means beardless ones. Oh. It's a very fucking hard language to navigate because there's not many sources on it. Um, in fact, there's the only like, I think there's a fully formed language called Neo Kuzdul. Which is what the a guy wrote for the like the Gimli's line in the films and stuff. But anyway, the dwarves believe that Aule has a separate part of the halls of Mandos set apart for them. And at the end of all things, after the last battle, which is called Dago Dagarath, which might just be a rumor, when the world is remade, because Melkor's fucked it up, so in the end, after all things, they're going to remake the world perfectly again, right? That the dwarves will be the ones to help Aule remake that world. And it's also said that the seven fathers of the dwarves come to live amongst their people again and again. Um, that's why the father of the most famous uh, dwarf clan, the Longbeards, that's who like Gimli and all that belong to, was called Durin. Mm. But the Balrog of Moria was called Durin's Bane. And he didn't kill the first Durin, he killed the sixth Durin. He killed Durin the sixth. Right, so he's he created seven dwarf fathers and there's seven dwarf clans, so they were the heads of the clans. Okay, right. So there was a mixture of men and women. No. Or how did they re- reproduce? That is a whole conversation about dwarven women, right? Because I personally, uh, it's supported in the history of Middle Earth series, but there's also conflicting supports elsewhere. That it's not really a thing that they talk about gender. And yeah, we've talked about dwarven gender, right? But it's my my uh, it, it's my belief that dwarven men are indistinguishable from dwarven women. Um, so maybe the fathers of the dwarves um, bred with others, or maybe some of them were women, or maybe they just fucking sprang out of the stone like Gimli says to Eowyn. You know, he said that like some people believe that dwarves spring out of the stone. So there are a whole um, like conversations that people have about how dwarves came to like be, and there's even some theories that Durin and the Longbeards are the only clan left by the middle uh, by the Third Age in Middle Earth because Durin married and intermingled and interbred, so that all just became one clan, which would be the Longbeards. Um, but then again, the, you know it, that's why I don't want this to be the only episode on dwarves because I, I love them and there's so much history to it. Um, but Dwarven Rebirth is particular to them. I don't think anybody else really has it. Um, it's not the same as Reincarnation. I looked this up because I thought, oh, it's just Reincarnation. Like, Durian comes back. But it's only in the line of kings that this happens, that the forefather, the, the Dwarven Fathers will come again and again. Um, it's said that if a Dwarf is born with the same temperament and appearance of one of the Seven Fathers of the line of kings, they are given that name again. So Durin, the Deathless, uh, eventually died. It wasn't that Deathless. But a while later, another dwarf was born who looked and sounded exactly like Durin. So he was called Durin again. And that's just that's how it goes. Like it's passed down, passed down, and passed down, right? Um, so by the time of Lord of the Rings, uh, I'm not sure which Durin. I think it might be Durin the Seventh, but I'm not sure. I could just be chatting shit. It's, it's said uh, it's not reincarnation, but it's the preservation of the body of a former king that his spirit returns to at different times. So, how indistinguishable that is from reincarnation, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting, just the idea that... Like, just imagine if, like, if, if your your granddad Derek, like, by the time, like, let's say our kid has kids, right? Uh, and she has a boy, and he looks and sounds exactly like your oh, granddad Derek. Oh, Lord. And he's like, I'm back! And we'd have to call him Derek the Second. Oh, um, <laughs> I know. There are seven clans of dwarves, as I I've mentioned. I don't get out, you know. I know. Oh, he doesn't get out. He doesn't get out. <laughs> he fucking does. Jesus. Better he's more, he's, he's, he's better travelled than Michael Palin. 
<laughs> but there are seven dwarf clans, and I didn't know they all had names un- until today. But um, apparently, I think it's volume twelve of the History of Middle Earth series is called The Peoples of Middle Earth, and there's a lot of dwarven history in that, which I need to pick up as part of my collection. Um, but the other, uh, so the main dwarven clan that's dealt mostly with Lord of the Rings, I believe, is the Longbeards. Um, the others are the Firebeards, the Broadbeams, and these two were from the Blue Mountains, which is at the far west of Eriador. Um, so you see I'm pointing at the map there. See the mountains closest to the sea? Yeah. Near Fall Linden and the Gulf of Loom? Yeah. So they're the Blue Mountains. Um, and that's where the, the Firebeards and the Broadbeams were. Because you, you remember, west of that, there used to be an entire continent. Yeah. And that's what the people would have to pass the Blue Mountains to get into Beleriand. Um, then the, the others all were from the, the east, which is the Iron Fists, the Stiff Beards, oh, yeah, <laughs> the Black Locks, and the Stonefoots. And they're all just said to have been from the east. And their large, their settlements were called the Mansions. Uh, each of them, like I think each of the Dwarven settlements were called Mansions. And that tracks because when Durin the First walk. He eventually, he wandered and eventually settled in the Misty Mountains uh, near Ke- uh, Keled Zaram, which is called Miramir. It's not in, uh, it is in the films, I think, but he settled in khazad which became Moria okay. eventually, right? Um, and it said he looked into the Miramir, which is Keled Zaram, and saw a crown of seven stars appear above his head. Um, and that's how he knew where to settle. And that he'd become the, 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 the king of the dwarves. But the others are noted as being from the east, and there is some evidence and some, um, well, not evidence, but there is some stories that some of the clans turned to evil and served Sauron and stuff, because it says at the Battle of Last Alliance that um, there was very few dwarves present, but there are reports, I think, somewhere of dwarves serving like Sauron and, and and that, or at least serving evil. And I know there was wars between men and dwarves at one point um, because uh, of like territory and that. But that was like back in like the first or the second age and whatnot. Um, there was, however, and this is pretty fucked up, right? This was nearly the fun fact for today, but I thought I'd just include it in the episode. There was an eighth clan of dwarves called the Petty Dwarves. And these were, uh, allegedly, these were all exiles who came from the other seven clans and might have were driven out because of evil deeds. Um, but some say they were driven out because of, like, might have been driven out because of physical deformities or other reasons to be an outcast. Mm. And they were smaller in stature and less sociable, and so they, they hid a lot more. And there is, uh, I think there's a petty dwarf called Mim, or Min, who appears in the... The Children of Hurin, which is a, a, a another tale that takes place in the, the First Age. Uh, basically, they, they are bastards. So they helped build a great elven city and then try to kill the king in his sleep. Um, so they weren't treated, trusted by elves. But before this, this is the fucked up fact today, right? The Sindar, el- the, the Sindar elves, and those are elves that Legolas comes from. Yeah. In the first age, they thought the petty dwarves were animals and hunted them for sport. <laughs> and it wasn't until other dwarves later made contact with them to set up trade routes and what have you that they were like, oh, oh fuck. So yeah, elves, like, it's weird because like elves aren't really, like you wouldn't think of them as like massive meat eaters and stuff like that. So I can only assume they were hunting them for sport. Which is, <laughs> like, first, right, first age elves... Compared to third age elves, are fucking wild. First age elves, um, there was the kin slaying. But I thought they didn't, so they don't have free will. Okay, so no, no, this is no, no. Elves, elves kind of have free will, but they can't fulfil it down to the detail. Like, and, and and first age elves are a different beast entirely. Like, they are fucking wild compared to third age elves. Because remember, third age elves are weary of the world. They want to pass on. They feel in the call of Valinor. They want to pass beyond the sea. So right? they're chill. They're, they're a lot more chill. First Age Elves, they laid siege to fucking Angband, I think, for 400 years. They um, they fucking hunted dwarves for sport. They killed each other. Um, they're like the Henry VIII. Yeah. yeah. Elves. Yeah, um, there was, um, there was, a, there was a, a necklace called the Nauglamir um, that dwarves made for the elves. And um, then the dwarves apparently tried to like steal it and... 
Anyway, and a load of dwarves ended up getting like massacred, and only two of them escaped, and that's what started the whole beef carrying on down the years, right? Okay. But um, f- we'll get onto them eventually. But yeah, first age elves are in their prime. You've got like um, I think is it Echthelion? I think Echthelion and Glorfindel, like two fucking badass elves. Glorfindel's in Lord of the Rings anyway. But Echthelion drowns a Balrog in a fountain at Gondolin. Um, and he dies at the same time as well. So he single-handedly takes down a Balrog. Glorfindel also single-handedly takes down a Balrog by fucking yeeting it off a cliff. Um, and he dies, he, like, he goes with it. Um, so they are, basically, they are wild, right? First age elves don't even. They are fucking crazy. Um, so yeah, it's not that far outside the realms of possibility. Well, not far outside the realms of acceptability, but they're pretty fucking crazy. Um, that they hunted dwarves for sport, which I was just like, the fuck. But I mean, these are the the sort of offshoots of dwarves, aren't they? These are well, the the, the petty dwarves, yeah. yeah. Um, and in the the children of Hurin, the the Mim does actually like betray and and end up getting people killed. Um. Yeah, but uh, so going back to um, just to going back to Yavanna and Aule, after Aule told like Yavanna, because eventually he opened his heart to Yavanna and was like, "I've made the dwarves, but I've got to put them back to sleep until until they work," and that's what started her off to go and and she was worried about the trees, right? Because he yeah. saw that she saw that Aule would want to make they'd want to make stuff because they were of Aule. And she went to Manwe, uh, and eventually they like spoke to Eru, and that's where Ents and Eagles come from, which we'll discuss next week. But I think we'll discuss Ents, Eagles, and then it's going to have to be something else because I don't think that's enough of them for an episode. But is there anything else that begins with an E? Yeah, I know, right? Um, Ent wives. Oh, that's a sad tale, actually. <laughs> um, but she goes back to Aule, and she says, "I worry that your creations are going to run amok and tear up my trees." And I've asked for shepherds to protect them. And Aule is working away while he does it. And he looks up and says, nonetheless, they still need wood. And then carries on working. I was just sort of like, just such a, a I'm sick of your shit moment. It's like, Yvonne is like, they're going to kill all my trees. Like, all they want to do is make stuff. And, and, and like, because dwarves are blacksmiths or stonemasons primarily, right? Um, and she was like, they're going to burn stuff. And he's like, yeah, well, still going to need wood. And then just carries on going back to his work. <laughs> oh, damn. The Sounds wor- like you. Yeah, I was going to say, the worst thing is that's a conversation I can see happening between a married couple, which is... Uh, whoops. <laughs> so that there is the creation of the dwarves. Do you have any questions, queries, or comments? On it that? is purely just how do they recreate? Yeah, uh, interesting. Like, I, I, I think they, pre- they recreate... Like, uh, sorry, I think they procreate normally... I'd have to look up, look it up, but I'm pretty sure they fuck, right? But, oh, no, sorry. They do fuck, but they don't fuck as much as you'd think because in the appendices of Lord of the Rings, the dwarves dwindle away as a race eventually to nothing because they don't breed as much because they're so caught up with their work. They'd rather work than fuck. We all know people like that, don't we, really? Yeah, we do. We do. I'm not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, so they, they don't as much as they perhaps should, but they're, it's just, it's because, um, so dwarven language is a super well-kept secret. Yeah. Dwarven, because they, so there's a lot of things dwarves don't reveal to outsiders. Their language, their real names, and their women are a very, very closely guarded secret. And so because of that, there's very little information about them. Um, I'm personally of the opinion that they're indistinguishable from men because they have beards, because you know, that's cool, that's fine, that's awesome. But also, so my personal opinion, right, is that they are indistinguishable from men. You don't find out your agenda until you're, like, pretty much married or about to be married. And both sexes would rather work away at the forge or, like, the quarry. So are they bisexual, do you think? No, I think without it's more an, like... Like, without an intention? No, I think it's more like um, sapiosexual. Do you know what, it's the intelligence. Like it, or like, I know it might not be the right word, but they would. It wouldn't be like a choice. It wouldn't be like because they wouldn't know who was a man and a woman. It'd yeah, just be like, oh, I really like your personality. I mean, it just. I think the difference is like 
do they pull on the braids at the back of your head or do they pull on your beard? <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be the only the, the only difference. <laughs> oh. That might be the only difference. Um, I, but yeah, I, I think so. The, I think they procreate normally, right? Um, but so let's just clarify that he like made them. I all, almost imagine them being like. Little morphs. Yeah, like out of clay. Yeah, like out of clay, yeah. Just made out of clay. But except it was But he only yeah. made seven of them. Or did he make seven, seven f- and the seven clans? That no, he made seven fathers. So it's never specified. It might have been that there was like a proto dwarf race that they went with, or it might be so or he might have afterwards, when they woke up, he might have made seven mothers to go with them, but like we we don't know. There's a lot of the legendarium that you've you've got to say I don't know, and that's perfectly fine because that's where there's room for creativity there if you're so inclined or like you're never going to know everything. It's just we're talking. There's a fuck of a lot that you can know. Yeah, I just forget that this isn't real. I know, and, and I I don't help because I say us and them. Like I, I it, Tolkien's done such a good job of it being a fictional history. I listen. I, I, I treat it as history. So we'll look into dwarf sex after this. I'll give it a Google and see what comes up. All right. But um, that is everything for dwarves for today. Uh, it's a good start for 10 because there's so much more I could say about dwarves and um, like they helped build cities in the first age and, and the Nalglamir when it comes to like the beef with the elves uh, and what have you. And Legolas and Gimli, um, just episodes by themselves, you know. Yeah. Um, are you ready for your fun fact of the day? Yes. No, this is a bit of a long one. So it's a fun fact slash speculation, which I've called factulation. C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien were very good friends, right? Yeah. You knew that. Yeah, that, knew. Good, that wasn't the fun fact. <laughs> they were involved in clubs together, including the Coalbiter Society in the 1920s, which was a group that read Icelandic and Norse sagas together. Like, they'd get together and read Beowulf to each other. Okay. And that's not the fun fact. That's just a bit of background, right? Against a roar and fire with it their was, matching... It, it was because... They're matching furs so col- and nothing underneath. No, so it was called the Coal Biters, but it's spelled K-O-L-B-I-T-A-R, right? Which is kind of like a Norse play on Coal Biters because Coal Biters would sit so close to the fire that the embers would bite yeah. them. Yeah. Right? Okay. So they would get together and it was a, it was a time uh, every week to be away from your wife and your kids and that and just get together and have like uh, some pints and read like Norse and like recite sagas to each other. Yeah. Fucking awesome. That's not the fun fact. They also belonged to a club called the Inklings, which was um, a literary group associated with Oxford University that uh, met between the 1930s and 50s, and they'd meet to discuss literature. And it's at these meetings that The Lord of the Rings was first read, and it because they talk about their unpublished works yeah. to, get, to get ideas. That's not the fun fact. <laughs> but they were such good friends that Tolkien, um, C.S. Lewis called him Tollers, which was the most fucking cookie cutter posh boy nickname yeah. ever. Oh yeah, Tollers. Like yeah, but anyway. Um Tolkien allegedly based the mannerisms of Treebeard, the Ent, on C. S. Lewis. His loud booming voice and the fact that he took very, very long strides. Alright? But also super, super allegedly, I'm trying to find a source for this. There is a Tolkien letter in which Tolkien says C.S. Lewis's voice could be heard, because they're both taught at Oxford, could be heard down the hallways when he was lecturing, even behind closed doors. And because his voice was so deep and booming, that behind closed doors and down the corridor it sounded like, home, home. (laughs) Which is very entish noises, right? (laughs) And... uh, your bonus fact is that, likewise, C.S. Lewis allegedly based a character on Old Tollers. The protagonist of a book that C.S. Lewis wrote called Out of the Silent Planet, uh, the main character, Dr. Elwyn Ransom, was a philologist at Oxford University. Um, uh, sorry, it was a philologist at Oxbridge University, which in real life, Tolkien was a philologist at Oxford University. Mm. And Oxford and Cambridge together, obviously, is Oxbridge. But yeah, I thought um, I thought friendship would be the, the, the fun fact. Um, that was a fact full of facts. I know, right? I, I know. I realised uh, I could have just split them up and yeah. live for weeks on that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just like the idea that like Tolkien one day is just walking down the corridor and all your ears, boom! Home. 
And then he sees C.S. Lewis like taking these big long strides, and he's like, "You're a tree, motherfucker." Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's just uh, aye. But that's it for this week. Do you feel like you've learned things? Yes, Good. and it doesn't feel like it's been too heavy either. So that's that's nice because there's usually a lot of um, names. Whereas this hasn't been as name heavy. No, just the seven dwarf clans. And as well, like the the names of the clans are very sort of what you would expect. Yes. And do you know what? As we were going through them, right? So you have like ones that are in the least, like the Blacklocks and the Stonefoots and that. And then all the thought was that like in Rings of Power, there was that big whole kerfuffle about Deesa. Uh, you haven't watched that. I don't know why I'm looking at you. There's Deesa, <laughs> who's Durin's wife. Uh, I think it's Durin the fourth or the fifth. Anyway, one of the the main character, one of the dwarf characters, is Durin, and she's played by a black actress with no beard. Fucking offends me to the core the idea that you'd cast someone who didn't have a beard to play a dwarf woman. It's just horrible. But I don't think there's a lot of women out there with beards. Uh, the Great Showman had one. <laughs> um, American Horror Story had one. It weren't real beards, though. Yeah, true. Well, who knows what you can do. But anyway, but the, so like there was a lot of hubbub about like, um, oh, there's a black dwarf, and oh, like there's a black elf, and, and what have you. The, th- the fact is, like in the Legendarium, there is already scope for these things. Like, you could have even just went super... De- like, if it was descriptive, right? You think of black locks, you know, like black curly hair, right? Yeah. D- traditionally, right? A lot of black people have like curly hair, right? Yeah. So you, did, why couldn't Adisa have just been of the, the Blacklocks clan? And like you, you're starting to see the intermarried like of the clans, which would have been fucking awesome. Like imagine feed it, and that would have been such a good nod. It should be. It could have said like a throwaway line of like, you know, I came to Casa Doom from the east, and it's been a big adjustment for me, and my family haven't, you know, like my family haven't liked it, but it was political or whatever. And then boom, you could have introduced the whole fucking thing for I I know law nerds would have went wild for that. But uh, I um, just uh, it's just it's fascinating that there's so much of the legendarium, and then th- there's times where things get left out, but when it's like adapted, but that's the nature of the beast. But I uh, next week I think we'll discuss Ents, Eagles, and Ent Wives possibly. Um, I feel like that's pretty lazy. Ent well, wives. no, it, it's. I feel it, like this. This is going to be another species out there that begins with an A. Eskimos. No, they're just people. In Tolkien. Oh right. I mean, not. There is oh, I th- no. There is people who live in the northern west. I think, which is like up north. Depends whether you're being politically correct. Yeah. E- well, if eagles, ants, edoras. Just talk about that one patch <laughs> of Rohan. <laughs> but no. Um, we'll wrap it up today. We'll see you next week. Uh, that's a-, a goodbye from me, Chris. And bye from Rebecca. And we'll catch you next time.